Uh, I'm Mike Place. Uh, I am on the core development team at uh, SaltStack. And uh, today we're going to, uh, to talk about a lot of things. And so I want to begin by uh, giving a little bit of a, a disclaimer about this presentation, which is that uh, this is not a presentation uh, in which I hold anybody's hand and write Perl. Uh, and in fact, it does not uh, contain all that much uh, technical information uh, until something toward the end. Uh, instead, what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a lot about uh, the history of a lot of other things uh, other than computers, and then uh, toward the end, we're going to talk about uh, DevOps. And so if you're here for a, uh, a moderately or highly technical presentation, I will not be offended at all uh, if you decide to choose another one. I just wanted to make sure that you had a fair warning. What I'm going to talk about today uh, is tooling. Um, and I want to make the case that uh, inside our infrastructure, uh, or inside our infrastructures, that uh, tooling plays an important role, and that it's something that uh, we can think somewhat deeply about, uh, and that we can learn uh, from the tooling that we use. Obviously, tooling has been something that's with has been a part of humanity for for many many years. Uh, it's what brought us out of the dark ages. It's what enabled agriculture. Uh, and of course, it's what uh, these days uh, you know brings us back from standing man back down to uh, to sitting man back down to uh, a man uh, reading a book. Uh, we've always had tooling, and uh, obviously we always will. I want to start our story here um, at this location. Normally, when I give this talk, it's somewhere out of state, and so I get to give this really elaborate uh, description. Um, I don't suppose anybody knows where this is. It's an extremely nondescript photo, so of course, you know, it's no surprise if you don't. It's not in Vernal, is it? It's not that far from Vernal, actually. Um, it's in uh, central Utah. Uh, to give you more of a hint, uh, this is actually really close to Price, um, and uh, really close to uh, Nine Mile Canyon. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Nine Mile Canyon. Um, if you aren't, uh, you certainly should be. Um, however, this is an area called Range Creek. And I want to start today by talking a little bit about the history of Range Creek and why I think it's important when we talk about uh, what's going on today in modern DevOps and uh, modern computing. And I swear to you, there is in fact a connection that we will, we will get to by the end of this. Range Creek is, uh, interestingly, one of the most archaeological important sites in the entire world. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Range Creek was homesteaded uh, in uh, the mid-1800s uh, by a gentleman named Otto Wilcox uh, in about 1888. Um, if you're driving down to Moab along Highway 6, you've probably seen the book cliffs. And like me, you've probably wondered what's on the other side of the book cliffs. What's on the other side of the book cliffs is this. It's Range Creek. When, and what's so interesting about Range Creek is that it's entirely protected by the book cliffs. And what happened uh, about 15 years ago now, about uh, 2001, was that um, an archaeologist from the uh, Utah Museum of Natural History was down that way and started having this conversation uh, with some ranchers uh, down in this area. And uh, he was talking about the fact that he was an archaeologist and so on and so forth. And uh, the rancher said, yeah, you know, we've got some really interesting stuff um, over here in, uh, in this little valley where, uh, you know, this family's been doing some ranching. You should come take a look. And as it happened, um, there are something like 20,000 Fremont artifacts um, in sitting in this Five Mile Canyon essentially undisturbed because the family has just left them there. They've done nothing uh, but ranching. Um, and it's now controlled by the Utah Museum of Natural History. And uh, the reason I tell you all of this is first to encourage you to visit Range Creek uh, because you can do so by purchasing a permit from the Utah Museum of Natural History, uh, which costs $1. Um, and you pay your $1 permit and you drive down there and you get to see stuff like this. What this is, is uh, carved out high in the cliffs um, are, uh, are remnants of uh, ancient tools uh, used by the Fremont Indians uh, about 2,000 years ago. Well, actually about the, the, sorry, about five to 600 years ago. Um, 
And uh, what they would do is they would actually scale up these cliffs and um, they would uh, use these uh, holes in the rock, these are called granaries, uh, to husk and store corn uh, for the season. The interesting thing about this is that it's one of the uh, places in which uh, they left all of their tooling. Because what happened to the Fremont uh, culture, uh, we think, is that um, all we really know is that uh, they left um, uh, Range Creek uh, very, very suddenly, on the order of a couple of weeks, um, and they were all gone. Uh, they're not sure whether that was weather, uh, whether that was war, or what have you. But the interesting thing about this is that all of their tooling was left behind. You can see there another example um, of some of the tooling that was left behind in Rain Creek. You can see those divots there in the rock. Uh, that was where they would uh, uh, create rocks and they would use that to uh, actually husk the corn uh, and grind it down uh, into flour. The point being that one of the ways in which, or in fact, the premier way in which we understand this and other ancient cultures is by looking at their tooling, right? Um, because while we have a couple of pict uh, or a number of pictographs that are there, um, if you talk to any of the uh, the archaeologists who work there, um, they'll tell you that most of their work revolves around trying to understand the problems that they faced as a result of the tools that they made to address those problems. And we're going to connect this here to, uh, to DevOps and modern computing as we go along. There's a secondary example of this. Does anybody know where this is? Because this is actually not that far from here. This is the boiler at the Prince of Wales Mine. Um, the Prince of Wales Mine is located above Alta in uh, Grizzly Gulch. Um, you can hike up there. It will take you like an hour, maybe. Um, and at the top, this is about uh, 10,700, 10,800 feet uh, above sea level, right on that high ridge between Little and Big Cottonwood Canyons, you see this boiler. And it's really nice to see um, the people here because you can get a sense of the size of this thing, right? Uh, this boiler was actually made uh, in the central part of the United States uh, and shipped here. Uh, one of the things that I like to joke, joke about is that if you think your software deployment is hard, uh, imagine how hard it was to deploy that to the top of a mountain. The reason that I point this out is um, one aspect uh, of tooling, be it uh, ancient or relatively modern, is that uh, tooling has always had an ornate component to it, and that's one of the things that I think is most interesting about this. Um, you can see here that even though they had to drive this thing up to the top of a mountain, uh, they still took the trouble uh, to make uh, the steam stack of the boiler, uh, if you go look at this other parts of this, uh, extremely ornate. So, I get to the point that I want to make, which is that when we examine the history of an era, too often we restrict ourselves to the, the things that that era built, right? The things that they produced. But another way to look at that, and another way to look at the work that we do day to day, is not to look at the things that we produce, but the tools that we use to produce them, right? To understand that history, we need to both look at the tools, right, and the things that were, that were produced by them. Now let's start to talk about uh, computers. Uh, it's likely that nobody knows uh, what this is. Um, it's actually really, really pretty. There are um, two shots of it here. This is the, uh, the IBM Selective Sequence Machine. Uh, it was built in uh, 1969, uh, and this is the computer that they use uh, to plan for and manage the Apollo moon landings, right? The interesting thing about this, if you look at uh, these two photos, is that we haven't really lost this sense of the ornate. And in fact, um, in the 60s and 70s, when you look at the types of computers that were being built, uh, because they were so large, they took this sense of beauty and architecture uh, and they applied it to these rooms that they built to house these computers in. As you can see, they're actually really, really beautiful. Right? Now, let's start to talk about automation. Okay? Um, we have this thing now uh, called uh, DevOps and configuration management. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my day job is building uh, configuration management and automation tools. Uh, but automation is something that I think that it's important that we stop to think about as a principle. 
um, because all too often I think we assume that automation is nothing but pluses, that it's nothing but good, right? Um, and automation does improve a lot of things. When the threshing machine came out, uh, that was about 1890, um, it revolutionized agriculture. Uh, when we automate things, we can produce uh, more, uh, uh, we can produce more in less time, right? Uh, reliability tends to increase as the result of uh, automation. Uh, we can uh, all of a sudden guarantee more or less the production of goods at a consistent rate, right? Uh, we like to believe that the quality increases, the ability to standardize on a given form uh, ensures that that form is easily reproducible, right? And of course, cost, right? Um, the ability to lower the cost uh, of each unit produces increases. But what I want to talk to you about is the idea that automation also has, well, downsides, right? Um, that, uh, that with any principle um, or philosophy in computer science, um, there are always trade-offs. And we should look at what those trade-offs are and be honest about what they might be. Uh, there are things that do not improve when we automate them, potentially. One of them is abstraction. Um, abstraction it can be a positive. Computer science has a long history of abstraction. We've been doing this now for 40 plus years, right? Uh, we've abstracted away hardware, right? Uh, we've abstracted away uh, low-level assembly, right? We've even started to abstract away, uh, you know, system calls in C, and now we're into these very high-level uh, programming languages like Python, and of course, you know, in web application frameworks, we're abstracting this stuff even higher. So abstraction, on one hand, is very good, but abstraction can also be a negative um, because when you abstract things, you introduce well, sets of layers, right? In between the point at which you've abstracted, right? And the physical thing that's happening underneath. And as a result of those layers, it's very easy to pretend or, or perhaps even uh, assume uh, that we don't need to understand um, all of those layers in between. We can just say, well, you know, uh, I'm working in this very high level language and I don't need to understand what's going on in the silicon. And frankly, that may be true. But the point is, it also might not be true, right? Craftsmanship. When we automate, it's very easy to focus on process over polish, right? Um, you know, we see this a lot. Um, you know, people are very interested in the practical effects of things. Um, but it's also very easy to lose sight of creating something that's very, very polished and very, very nice to show off because it's very, very tempting to just go, okay, well, we're only going to get up to the point where the automation works and then we're going to stop, right? And the last point is safety. Uh, and I want to talk about this a little bit through uh, an example. Automation makes it exceedingly easy uh, to destroy everything, right? Um, there are a lot of horror, horror stories about this. Uh, again, because I produce automation software, I get to hear a lot of them, uh, unfortunately. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, something that happened, uh, you know, well, during the 20th century. Uh, has anybody ever heard of the Texas City disaster, also called the Galveston disaster? Um, yeah, one, okay. So, I just want to tell this story real quick. What happened was, um, there was a ship that pulled in uh, to the port of Texas City. And uh, it was filled, unfortunately, with ammonium nitrate, right? And uh, at the same time, they also, uh, unfortunately, uh, allowed the, uh, the, uh, the crew to smoke on board. And uh, somebody flipped a cigarette uh, into uh, the bay of uh, a ship. This was filled with 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate. And uh, it started to smolder and smolder. And, uh, People started to, uh, it actually started to boil the ocean around uh, the ship. The ship was equipped, however, with um, an automated uh, fire uh, suppression mechanism, right? Um, and what it would do, this was like the leading fire suppression you know, technique at the time, uh, is they would pump steam uh, into the help hold. Does anybody know what happens if you pump steam into a hold full of ammonium nitrate? It oxidizes, right? Um, so now, uh, instead of having a solid bomb, uh, you essentially have an ammonium nitrate aerosol bomb, uh, which is uh, a pretty big problem. Uh, long story short, uh, eventually it exploded. Uh, it literally knocked planes out of the sky. It knocked buildings over 10 miles away. 
uh, and people felt it over 150 miles away in Louisiana. Uh, it was a terrible tragedy. tragedy. Um, but it brings me to this point. Do not automate what you do not understand, right? Last time I made everybody take a pledge, but because uh, my laptop is, uh, seems to be going quite slow today, uh, we'll skip the pledge. This is a very important point. Because we have these powerful tools, one of the arguments that I want to make is that we need to not decrease our understanding, not uh, assume that the tools will take care of it for us, not assume that they will make life easier, not assume that we have to understand less because we have these automated processes in place, but instead, I argue that we need to flip that on its head, and because we have these automated tools in place, we need to increase our understanding. We need to look more at what's happening under, underneath these layers of abstraction. I relate this to something that a lot of us know about here because we live in Utah. Um, this is uh, an avalanche, I believe, coming down at Bonobus a few years ago. Um, avalanche safety, right? I think avalanche safety, uh, if, if you know a lot about avalanche safety, has a wonderful set of parallels uh, to modern, modern uh, systems operations. And I want to talk briefly about what those are. Uh, in avalanche safety and modern, uh, uh, modern snow science safety, uh, one of the things that we talk about is uh, the relationship between probability and consequences. And I think this has, uh, is, is very important uh, in modern operations. Um, and basically this breaks down like this. Um, on one vector is uh, the probability uh, that uh, an avalanche will occur, right? On the second vector is the, um, uh, uh, the hazard uh, that, that will occur if an avalanche does occur. And so um, we use this uh, as a, uh, a decision-making engine uh, when we decide which days are safe to go out. We may say, for example, uh, well, there is uh, a high probability that avalanches are going to trigger but if an avalanche does trigger, the probability of us dying is very low, right? Or we may say to ourselves, well, there's a very low probability that an avalanche will trigger if I go up across this slope, but if I do, I'm going to die, right? And most of the time, um, if only one of those vectors is high, we can manage the risk, right? Um, but what we do is we recognize that when both of those vectors are high, it's time to stay home. Right? Um, and I think that uh, we can apply this, um, like I said, uh, to our own infrastructures uh, by thinking about uh, which points um, could fail, right? the likelihood of their failure, and the amount of uh, hazard or danger uh, that will be incurred if and when they do fail. Does anybody know who these gentlemen are? Somebody's got it. Don't be so sad. Okay. One of them is Dennis Ritchie. I yeah. think I heard somebody say that. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, the other one is uh, Ken Thompson. Right. Um, they worked in something called uh, the Unix room, which I really, really like. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think it was Ken Thompson who talked about uh, when he used to work in the Unix room was that, um, the whole, that his whole job, right, he, he said a couple things. The first was that um, was that the programmer's job is to automate themselves out of business, right? I, I think that was Ken Thompson's mind, but I, I don't remember for sure. Um, but the second thing that he said that I think is really important was that um, he said that their daily practice um, was to think about reasons that they shouldn't do things, right? Um, that they didn't think about um, features that they should add. That wasn't the problem that they were trying to face. The problem that they were trying to face and deal with was coming up with reasons that they shouldn't build features. And I think that's a really, really nice way uh, to think about operations, right? Because nobody in here you know, has any sort of lack of, uh, has, no, has no small list of things they want to build, right? Um, but I would challenge you to go back and look at that list. And instead, you know, instead of lamenting that you don't have time to build all of these things, Instead, go back and uh, try to come up with reasons that you shouldn't build all of them. Uh, and it may very much change your attitude. Uh, it's a practice I, I try to undertake, and it very much changes mine. These two gentlemen, uh, along with some other folks, uh, came up with something that uh, hopefully everybody in this room has heard of and, and knows very well, called the Unix philosophy. Right? Um, 
And the first thing that I, well, let's talk about it first. Um, the Unix philosophy um, can be stated as write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs that work together. The idea of loose coupling we talk about a lot. Uh, and write programs to handle text streams because text streams are a universal interface. Right? The reason that I bring this up and the way that I want to connect all of these disparate points together is that when these gentlemen were sitting in the Unix room, right, um, if you hear them talk about this or if you've ever read interviews with them, uh, one of the things that they talk about is that they said this was really the first time in the history of computing that people thought about software programs as being tools, right? Prior to that point, you know, they had applications, I suppose you could call them, I don't remember what they called them, uh, but they said, we switched our philosophy uh, from just thinking about that to starting to think about how to build reusable tools, right? This is a really important point, this idea that we haven't always just had this idea in computer science. It's, it, we've, at some point, these gentlemen sat down and said, you know what we need? We need to build tools, and they did, all right? So, when they did so, uh, they came up uh, with this paradigm. Uh, this is uh, Brian Kerrigan. Much of the power of Unix operating systems comes from a style of program design that makes programs easy to use, and more importantly, easy to combine with other programs. This style has been called the use of software tools, and depends more on how programs fit into the programming environment and how they can be used with other programs than how they are designed internally. The style is based on the use of tools, using programs separately or a combination to get a job done, rather than doing it by hand. So on and so forth. Yeah. Ah, here's the quote I was thinking of. This was uh, Doug Middleroy. Um, if you've ever read anything by Doug Middleroy, uh, he is, uh, I don't want to say uh, grumpy, but um, Doug Middleroy, I, I, I think, is, uh, is a very prominent critic of Linux. And you don't really hear about that, right? Like, it's not very often, I, I bet nobody in this room could think of five prominent critics. Like, it's not a thing right now, right? Uh, but Mr. Lipperory is one, right? Um, he said, um, or one of the things that he said was that um, back when they were working uh, at Bell Labs, um, that uh, the entire man page was a man page, right? Uh, and he said he weeps to look at the state uh, of man pages these days because he says they have every conceivable option and it's too much. He said we never designed it to be like this, right? We designed man pages to be a single page. Um, and he said things have gotten way, way out of hand. And he has, he has wonderful uh, additional criticisms about Linux, which I think are, are very much worth reading. So let's turn our attention now uh, to DevOps, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you know John Ospaw. Um, he's uh, uh, he works at Etsy now. He used to work at Flickr. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. If you ever get a chance uh, to meet him or chat with him, it's very much worth your time. It's very much go worth your time to go to any conference that he speaks at, and he speaks at a lot. Um, John Ospaw was one of the guys um, who uh, originally uh, was around when they coined the term DevOps. Right? He was a Flickr at the time. Right? And when he goes back now and he talks about the history of DevOps, um, he says, let's look at the beginning, right? There was no difference between Dev and op Ops, right? Back when we looked at, um, you know, the, uh, the sequential calculator that IBM built, right? You know, there weren't developers in one room, right, doing Dev stuff and then throwing it over the wall to Ops guys, right? It was all one team, right? Um, and um, a lot of times we forget uh, that this idea of a differentiation between dev and ops is not particularly old, um, especially when you apply it uh, to the age of, uh, of computing as a whole. All right. uh, these slides are actually mixed up a little bit. But one of the things, of course, um, that uh, enabled the problem set of DevOps itself uh, was a problem of scale. Uh, that, uh, you know, for many, many years, right, uh, we had systems and you had a data center or a room to put them in, and when your room was full, you were done, right? Um, and so, um, although it wasn't always pretty, humans could more or less scale with that problem, right? You know, if we had to build another room, we could probably get another guy to come and help us out with that, and that was all fine and good. And then virtualization uh, came along, it became a thing, and uh, that paradigm was completely shot, because of course, all of a sudden, 
uh, you could have a room full of machines and 100,000 servers to manage, right? Um, and that changed the fundamental nature of what system administration looked like, right? Um, it very quickly became a problem of scale, right? And so it can be very difficult or troubling or even, frankly, confusing for guys like me who have been doing this now for 25 years, right? Uh, because we woke up, you know, five years ago and said this, everybody is out DevOpsing and I'm just sitting here uh, sysadmining, right? Um, and I think that's something important to think about when we think about uh, the DevOps movement, that um, we still have machines running on real silicon, on real hardware, um, that system administration is still an extremely, extremely important task. And while it's very trendy to talk about this idea of uh, developers owning the tool chain uh, from end to end, uh, so long as we're running systems on hardware somewhere in the world, people are going to need to manage those systems. Uh, and we need to respect and build uh, tooling for those individuals. Mark Burgess, I don't know if any of you uh, know or have uh, ever talked to Mark. Uh, Mark is the creator of uh, a CF Engine. Uh, of course, when we talk about DevOps tooling, a lot of times we talk about you know, configuration management, right? Uh, which personally I think is a little bit, a little bit silly because in my view it's kind of hard to talk about a, a cultural movement or sol solving this cultural or institutional problem uh, with technology. Because let's look at, you know, again, the broader history. That hasn't always worked out well for us, right? Um, Mark is a guy who writes um, and, and does work uh, around tooling as a philosophy. And, uh, and CF Engine was very much built on that, right? Uh, Mark actually uh, used to be a physicist uh, at CERN. He's probably one of the brightest people on the planet uh, and also one of the nicest. And you should read his books, including In Search of Certainty, which is wonderful. Um, but he talks about um, this explosion of information, right? Be it virtualization or big data or whatever it is, right? And he said one of the things that we have to do is we have to intentionally limit our scope, right? We have to be able to break these problems down, and that's what we're actually using all of this tooling to do. He right? <coughs> um, said, use that tooling and that limitation, right, as a tool, right, to understand things, to form the illusion of mastery and control over a limited scale of things. Um, because by being able to isolate only one part of a world, we reduce that hopeless problem to a manageable one. It's a very epistemological view, right, of modern computing. But you can see how DevOps and modern computing is starting to follow this, right? You see containerization, you see virtualization, following this idea that Mark Burgess has been beating a drum on now for 20 years, right? This idea that we need to, as complexity increases, we need to break apart that complexity into manageable, understandable, and controllable pieces. So in DevOps, we have this divide. Right? We, we now have dev on one side and we have ops on the other side, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to reconnect them. Right? And as I mentioned, uh, we have a number of uh, configuration management players uh, in the space. I don't think I need to go over any of them. If you want to talk to me about them later, that's perfectly fine. Like I mentioned earlier, um, we need to, one of the efforts that we're trying to do uh, in this space is to break things apart into this, these manageable pieces. Um, so to bring this back to tooling, Right? Um, what's like the biggest buzzword in DevOps right now? Right? Anybody? Docker, right? Oh, it's, yeah, Docker. Yeah. it's all Docker all the time, right? Which is great, and I have a lot of respect for the Docker guys. But I think we should think about the history of that tooling, right? Docker, of course, is, a, is fundamentally a containerization technology. Um, in, in way of a quiz, what came before Docker? What was, what was the predecessor to Docker? And how far back can we go? LXC. LXC is one. We can go back further than LXC, but that's a good one. OpenVZ. Open yes, very good. We can go back further than that. Um, the fine folks at Sun Microsystems in about 2005, right, introduced commercial containerization technology. But there's a really big one that we're missing when, we're, when we think about this technology that we actually now has been branded as very new. Right. Fundamentally, this technology is, is, is based around uh, CH root chains. Right. That's what it is at the end of the day. Right. 
Does anybody here know when uh, when CH root jails were introduced? What year? 1983 was the introduction of those. So we're talking about 25 years, effectively, of containerization technology. Um, and what we're seeing now, in many ways, is the problem space starting to catch up uh, with technology that has, for the most part, existed for a really long time. I work at SALT, um, and uh, one of the things that we try to do is we try to uh, take the idea of, uh, of tools which exist out in the real world um, and use them as uh, inspiration uh, for the tools that we build. Uh, we work on uh, a very interesting project uh, called IOFlow, uh, which is uh, flow-based programming. If you are interested in it, we can talk about it later. I don't want to take your time with it now. Uh, but the interesting thing about it, and, and one important thing that I think that uh, everyone here can take home, is that uh, IOFlow, and, uh, which is now very important in, uh, in the core pieces of SALT, was actually built for autonomous submarines, uh, originally from the U.S. Navy, uh, who needed to be able uh, to uh, have programs which could be uh, have some sense of a, <coughs> uh, some sense of self-control, but also uh, bounded limits, right? Uh, because obviously, if you have an autonomous submarine, especially if it's equipped with something uh, dangerous, uh, you probably don't want it to decide it's going to drive into San Diego Bay, for example. Uh, that project is called IOFlow. Uh, beacons is something else we're, we're working on. I don't really you know, want to spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, instead, I want to take this huge sort of splay that we've gone over uh, and try to boil it down into three questions. Um, I'm afraid I very rarely uh, have a presentation which, which uh, ends or concludes with any answers, but I hope that we have three questions that we can take back uh, to our own shops and ask ourselves. The first, how can we understand the problems that we are trying to solve by examining the tools which we use to solve them, right? How can we go back into our own IT infrastructure and uh, look at the tooling that we have selected, right? and ask ourselves, what is this tooling, what does it say to me about the problem set that I am really facing, right? Not just in terms of, am I using the right tool for the job, right? Uh, but are my problems really being solved, right? Um, what can we learn, right, about the problem set by looking um, at, uh, at, at the, the, the approaches that we're, we're using to solve them? Secondarily, um, uh, and actually, this came from uh, from Luke Kane uh, over at, uh, at Puppet, uh, who's a, a brilliant thinker and a very nice person. Uh, and he, one of the things that uh, that he talks about is uh, is this question of um, whether automation can decrease complexity or whether it can only increase efficiency, right? Um, and I think this is a really important question because. Uh, especially in that modern DevOps right now, there is this idea that um, that we can decrease complexity, right? Uh, that if only we use the right tools, right, that things will suddenly become less complex. And I think that's a premise that's worth challenging. <coughs> um, I think we can increase abstraction, but I don't think that the increase in abstraction necessarily decreases the complexity which lays beneath it. I think legitimate decreases in the uh, complexity uh, is very rare and very hard to achieve. And very often, those um, increases in efficiency uh, get sold or spun right, as decreases in complexity, when in fact they are not. Finally, um, are we using automation to augment our understanding or as a substitute for failing to understand? Right? Uh, I think it's important to go back and look at our infrastructures um, and really, really think hard about whether or not the tooling that we're building uh, is something that can increase our understanding or whether it's something that we're using not only to hide our own lack of understanding, right, uh, but something that could be potentially dangerous because it could hide somebody else's lack of understanding, right? Um, you hear stories about this all the time, right? People, you know, uh, you know, build some wonderful automated tool. We, we hear this all the time, quite frankly, to be completely honest with you. Sometimes people come to us and they say, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to put all this automation in place, and then we can have people who don't know what they're doing uh, modify our production infrastructure. And I say, what? Um, 
that does not sound like an amazing plan to me. Um, and, uh, and I think it's worth asking that question, um, whether we're trying to shortcut uh, uh, the necessary understanding to manage our infrastructure uh, by simply layering more and more technology and more and more automation uh, on top of it. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers uh, Matt's script archive. Is anybody old enough to remember that? Uh, yeah, one. Um, do you remember the sorts of problems Matt's script archive ended up causing? So to give you some background, uh, this was probably 90, like 94 through 96 about, yeah. Uh, and it was funny because the last time I gave this lecture, I, I did this, and Matt was in the audience. <laughs> so uh, that was not great. But um, Matt's script archive, <laughs> this was back um, when uh, pretty much everything, not everything, but uh, many things on the web was all, uh, it was all Perl CGI, right? Uh, and so there was this, this gentleman on the web who thought, you know what I'll do, right? Uh, and this was sort of, this was kind of around when open source was not really a thing. I mean, it was a thing, but it was not particularly common, right? He thought to himself, you know, I'll just sort of take all these, you know, common automated, you know, tasks that people have to uh, deal with, say, you know, putting up like an email form was a big one, right? Uh, you know, on a website. Uh, and I'll just sort of write some Perl and I'll stick it out there, right? And people can use it, right? Free automation. Um, and it ruined so many people's lives because what would happen is that people would use this automation, but they wouldn't understand what was being abstracted away from them, right? And we had huge problems because we had open mail relays everywhere, we had terribly insecure websites everywhere, sysadmins spent 40% of their week going around from site to site and telling people to stop installing stuff that you don't know how it works, right? Um, I'm not completely convinced that we've learned that problem, that we've learned that, right? We're still trying to convince ourselves, oh, you know, we can pick up these automation pieces, right, and we can just slap them in, and things will be great. Um, I think that's a premise that needs to be challenged as well. And so really, uh, those are the three questions that I hope we can take away. Um, I apologize for the, uh, the, the rambling and breadth uh, uh, of this particular presentation, but I hope it was uh, an enjoyable break from ones that were more technical. And I'm happy to take questions or, or, or discuss anything you like. So it's, yeah. oh. Interesting that we're about on time. Yeah. What's the worst breaking of automation that you've seen happen? <laughs> the, worst, the worst breaking of automation that I've seen happen, I actually can't tell you about. Um, but the second worst breaking uh, of automation uh, I've seen is uh, is probably people attempting to to automate network gear, uh, which is is still uh, not a. Per, eh, even though we sell products that do it, I, I don't think I can stand up and talk about it as being a solved problem. I don't think it is, right? Um, and so, uh, not that the technology isn't there, but we haven't developed processes to reason well yet about uh, the, uh, the automation uh, of networking. Uh, so I have seen some really nasty attempts at trying to, to automate network automation. And like, you know, we know what goes horribly wrong when, uh, when you know, networks fail. So you can only imagine what goes horribly wrong when network automation fails. Any other questions, concerns, disagreements, agreements? Anything of the, anything of the sort? Yeah. Um, you got, one thing you said was yeah. um, consider asking yourself what are the things that are really reasons not to do these type of things. Yeah, yeah. So what, um, I guess there's some examples or maybe scenarios where you think there's really good reasons to automate or sure. Like, I don't know, just, yeah. what is um, good to automate? Right, reasons not to automate things. Yeah. I don't think you should automate things necessarily because someone told you to do it. Um, and uh, we, we've got a lot of discussions from people, right, who are like, my boss told me that I need to automate all the things, right, because yeah. he read about it and said automation was really, really good, right? Um, I talked to a, a gentleman actually who worked in a major financial institution, uh, and he said internals of the financial institution, they were really having this battle, right? Um, you know, between the management who was saying, we need to do this stuff, and the guys who were saying, we're not there yet, right? Um, you're not going to get a net cre increase in efficiency, right? Because there are prerequisites to automation, right? Um, and so uh, I think that's the big problem that gets faced, is that, um, you know, and I'm not arguing against automation. I sell automation software. Like, automation is fantastic. Uh, but automation strictly for automation's sake 
the thing that we say to ourselves um, probably at least once a week, Daniel, my boss is here, and he hears <coughs> my shoe on the table about this all the time, um, is solve real problems, right? If automation doesn't solve a problem that you actually have, don't do it, <laughs> right? Um, you know, if you can't define the problem, don't make up a solution, whether it's automation or anything else. Any other questions, comments? Just yeah. curious how your exact statement there rolls into uh, designing new. Um, you know, instead of calling it, it's to go look at things that are already there and say, oh, we don't need all that. Yeah. But when, you, when you're going into something new and you're building yeah. it out, Correct. how do you, you can't know what you do or do not need. I mean, you, yeah. you can have some history, right, right. some good inferences, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, and that's a cart before the horse problem. Yeah, which I think is the point that you're making. Yeah, Daniel. So I was just wondering, Mike, if you don't pull it together from some of the mm -hmm. points that you made, that yeah. if you if you can define the subcomponents of what you're attempting to automate, mm -hmm. and you have done those, you understand them. Yeah. You're you're in a sense you're looking at just a couple architecture or yeah. component system, almost a SOA approach. Yeah. And, and then you automate what you already know and understand and mm -hmm. know is predictable and, and productive to yeah. yeah. It's kind of a systematic yeah. way to look at it. I think so. And I think if you were, <coughs> certainly the design case is not an exception, right? But um, in some way the rule still applies, right? You know, it's just a, it's just a tighter iteration. It's just a part of the design process, right? You know, outline the problem, design the solution, right? And think about how automation fits into that. That's exactly the same thing that we do on a macro scale, right? But it's a part of the design process, per se. Yeah, it's a little difficult when the uh, design process is difficult to be on the own things, right? It is, yeah. And I, I, it's, it's also difficult. I mean, yeah. your point right there kind of answers my question. If you don't understand it, don't automate it. If you're trying yeah. to build it, you don't understand it, well, then you shouldn't be building it. Uh, but there's yeah. certain things, especially in you know, Docker and yeah. um, yeah. You know, things like Kubernetes and other you know, yeah. very new bleeding edge things sure. that, that people are really trying to get on the bandwagon now. Right. Uh, it's kind of, yeah, no, I, 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 principles is there. I, I'm completely sympathetic to this idea that I'm coming to you from an ivory tower, right? Because I don't have to do ops work anymore. I write, I, you know, I get to do dev work all day. Um, but, um, but yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that the, that the point to make is not necessarily, oh, we need to push back against automation. Right, but let's just ensure that we have the understanding there, right? And maybe the understanding comes along as a part of the automation process, and that's fine, right? Uh, you know, infrastructure as, as code, you know, on a very broad sense, is a thing, right? Um, but you know, so long as that understanding comes along with the process and doesn't leave stakeholders behind, um, then I think it's okay. Any other questions, comments, feedback? No. Thank, thank you very much for, for coming by. Uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, feel free to come by and say hi. Thanks very much for your time.